Now, it's my great honor to introduce today's speaker. David Kaplan is executive director of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. He's based in Washington, D.C., but this is a truly global network, um, which is, has um, tons of resources, tips, and networking opportunities to help journalism, uh, journalists working around the world. And he's here to talk about the prospect for investigative journalism, um, especially in Asia. So please join me in welcoming David. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that nice introduction. Enid, a uh, very warm good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's great to be back at the Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, uh, I think I last uh, was on stage here in 1996. We were playing a, a blues gig downstairs at the bar. Uh, that was another uh, David Kaplan a long time ago. Uh, as Enid said, right, uh, I'm now executive director of a nonprofit network, the Global Investigative Journalism Network. We are uh, founded in 2001, but we, we set up our secretariat only two years ago. We have uh, 90 organization members in 40 countries. We're growing quickly. Uh, our membership is, is limited to nonprofit organizations. That's how we grew up. And it's really been the backbone of how a lot of investigative and data journalism has spread internationally. Uh, the, the backbone of, of what we do is every two years we hold the Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Uh, that, that's what the network grew up around. It was first held in 2001 in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, we didn't know if anyone would show up. Uh, the Americans and Danes got together and decided we needed a, a more of an institution, a institutional base for the world's investigative reporters to, to gather under. Uh, 300 people from 30 countries came together. And it turned out we had the same kinds of questions, we faced the same sorts of obstacles, and we needed to network in order to do the kinds of stories that globalization and, and economic and technological change were producing around the world. Um, so uh, you've got me at the, the tail end of a uh, three-week jaunt around Asia. Our, our networks are, are quite strong in Europe, in the Americas, where we're doing pretty well in Africa. We've got a great affiliate in, in the Middle East, Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Uh, we're uh, least strong here in Asia, and it's not because uh, of a lack of great investigative journalism. Uh, or great investigative journalists. Uh, we just have not uh, organized here. Uh, we're not as well networked, so I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to, to talk about the work that we do and uh, perhaps how we can help uh, our journalist brethren here in, in Hong Kong, greater China, and, and Asia uh, generally. Um, so I, I've done, um, I, I know it's a lunch, I almost didn't do a PowerPoint, and, and uh, don't worry, it's a good PowerPoint, it's not a bunch of items I'm going to repeat to you. Uh, this is pretty visual, and I, I, it's kind of a show and tell about what's happening around the world. Um, the, the, the theme of this is you're, you're not alone, and you know you're not. Uh, journalists in the audience, investigative journalism is exploding around the world. Uh, it has accompanied globalization because of cell phones and borders that have come down, uh, countries that have opened up, of course the internet, so much technology. I'm old enough to remember sending an intern to the library to, to get a stack of photocopies that you got through like, like a, uh, yeah, someone's as old as me out in the audience. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Um, and, and they'd bring it back and we do, we do this in about a minute right now. So technology's really been the great equalizer. We can do so much more with so much less. And we're getting organized globally. Uh, some of the, the, the great stories you've seen in the media, uh, it's just the beginning. And, and um, I, 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 there's a couple of messages I want to leave you with. Well, one is um, journalists get networked. This thing is exploding worldwide. One of the things that GIJN can do is connect you with your colleagues all over the world who are doing similar work. Our stories today are global. The breakfast you eat in the morning, 
the toys your kids play with in the afternoon, the medicine you take at night, it's all coming from other countries. We can help you trace those supply chains. We can help you find out who's involved in, in, in these business transactions. We can help make the world a little more accountable one story at a time. So, uh, uh, so get networked. That's really what I want to uh, leave you with today. So let me, let me uh, start on the tour. Um, you're probably familiar with what's been going on in, in uh, Ukraine. Um, when uh, uh, former President Viktor uh, uh, Yanukovych fled Kiev uh, 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 just over a month, I guess six weeks ago, uh, he left behind a trove of about 50,000 documents that they had dumped into a reservoir on his palatial estate outside the capital. Well, it turned out that there were a half dozen investigative journalists in Kiev who had been to our conferences and who understood about following paper trails, following money, and why that kind of resource was important. They got together, uh, volunteer scuba divers came and fished out the documents. They used uh, uh, Yanukovych's own guest sauna to, to dry them. You can see in this photo uh, a, a bit um, uh, uh, how they were drying them in a, in a uh, warehouse at the, it was actually a garage at the, the estate. Um, in, in about a day, all of this happened, and a nonprofit group, uh, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, <coughs> excuse me, threw this up on a website in about a day, and they called it Yanukovych Leaks. And there are now thousands and thousands of documents detailing how, how the president and his cronies misspent millions and millions of dollars, uh, uh, misappropriated uh, tax money, and uh, um, uh, created a private zoo on his estate. There's, there's, there's all kinds. Of, it had a journalist blacklist. There's all kinds of interesting stories that have, have come of this, and they, they, they keep posting. But I, there's a couple of things that are interesting. One is that there was a, a, uh, a group of world-class investigative journalists in Kiev who knew how to preserve these documents and to make them available. And two, there was the technology to post this for the world and, and actually crowdsource this and, and, uh, uh, and do reporting on it. Here's another recent story. Um, this is from a, a fairly new group, the Center for Investigative Reporting in Pakistan. Now, now I, I know you've got your problems here in Hong Kong, but, but try doing investigative journalism in, in Islamabad or Karachi. Uh, this is by a, a very gutsy fellow named Umar Chima who got a hold of all of the income tax returns for members of parliament in Pakistan. <clears throat> it turned out that half of the MPs didn't pay any tax at all. And, and if you know about Pakistan, you know one of their biggest problems is the government is broke. They can't collect tax money. It's one of their biggest problems. Uh, he embarrassed the hell out of, out of the parliament, and, and uh, he, he, put them, he not only put them online, but he analyzed it. He used data journalism to, to, to um, uh, analyze and, dis and visualize uh, who was paying taxes and who wasn't. As a result of this story, uh, Pakistan's become one of only four countries in the world that actually requires its MPs to, to uh, uh, make public their, their income tax returns. Um, this is a story from last year from uh, South Africa, from South Africa's Sunday Times, a, a three-person team uh, at the risk of death threats and, and uh, uh, all kinds of legal threats went after a, uh, an unaccountable uh, police team that had become vigilantes. It was, it was essentially a police death squad. Um, the, this photo is a uh, South African cop celebrating after killing three people. Um, uh, it was an incredible story. We, we gave them an award at, at our conference uh, last fall. It's won other awards in, in, in Africa. Very gutsy reporting. Uh, these three stories are all uh, quite recent. And it shows you what's happening in very different environments around, around the world and how journalists are, are using uh, some pretty state-of-the-art tools to, to do um, uh, just extraordinary work. Um, here's who we are. We're, we're at uh, www.gijn.org. Our, our Twitter feeds at gijn. Uh, our website is visited by journalists in about 70 countries a day. 
Uh, we didn't know that there would be as much demand. We knew there was a need for this when we established our secretariat two years ago, but the, the thing has really taken off. There, there's, there's huge demand because people want investigative journalism all over the world. They, they want to know what's really going on. They want accurate, professional data. Uh, you can see uh, our, our member organizations, and, and uh, uh, don't let Africa fool you. We, we have uh, one group that covers much of sub-Saharan Africa. You can see the, the, the big dearth of activity is here in Asia. Uh, but I think that's going to change pretty soon. Um, all right, well, what am I talking about? What is investigative reporting? Uh, if you look up investigation in a dictionary, it means systematic inquiry. It's, it's, uh, do beat reporters use investigative tools? Absolutely. In fact, more than half the people at our conferences and our workshops are beat reporters. Uh, we're, we're all in this together. Um, but investigative reporting does go the extra step. It uses advanced tools and techniques. Uh, some people say it's just more. We do more interviews. We follow more documents. We look at, 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 at uh, uh, more data sets. Uh, it has a history of focusing on social justice and accountability. Uh, in my own country, the states, it goes back uh, more than 100 years to the, the, the fellows we used to call the muckrakers, not just fellows. We, we had great people like Nellie Bly and Ida Tarbell who wrote the history of the Standard Oil Company, uh, which was probably the most powerful company of, of its time. These people blazed the way with accurate, responsible, but hard-hitting investigative journalism. Um, on our site, you can find a calendar. You can find uh, ways to get connected to journalists worldwide. There are resource pages. The resource pages are actually the most popular part of our site. You can see data journalism, freedom of information, uh, grants and fellowships, the most popular page on our site. So um, if, if, if you're looking for a break, uh, journalists, um, it's a good place to start. Um, where it says join the global conversation, Get connected. We reach more than 30,000 people in, in 120 countries with people trying to find information. It's a very generous community. We have a listserv with 600 of the best reporters in the world. There are questions every day asking, how do I find documents in Greece? Can someone help me find a reporter in Guinea-Bissau? Uh, and, and it's just one mark of uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how we're connecting everybody. Um, uh, uh, this is the website for our conference. I'm going to skip along here because uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk too long. Um, here's what's happening globally. There, there are thousands and thousands of investigative journalists. Nonprofits have really come to the forefront. Uh, I worked at the original Center for Investigative Reporting in San Francisco many years ago. Uh, there are now, whoops, come back. Uh, there are now more than 115 nonprofits worldwide. Uh, that are doing, promoting, supporting investigative journalism. There's a new Korean Center for Investigative Reporting that's doing great stuff. Uh, the one in the Philippines helped blaze the trail when they started in, in 1989. Um, uh, we're, we're working with groups in Africa. In, in, uh, uh, I was just in Myanmar meeting with journalists who want to form a network there. Very exciting. Uh, we have dozens of academic programs. Uh, the universities, the journalism schools, have really become laboratories. They call it the hospital model of teaching, where the, the J schools are, are actually generating content now. Very exciting what, what's going on and, and lots of training. Um, and here's another development. It's, it's important to, to media freedom generally, but uh, investigative reporters love uh, RTIs. They love right to information or freedom of information laws. Um, and here's what's happening. There, there are now some 93 countries globally that have freedom of information laws. This didn't exist even 15 years ago. Uh, that's how quickly things are changing. Now, are these laws enforced? Mm, half of them have a lot of trouble, including in, in, in Washington. Bureaucrats do not like these laws. We, we know that. But where the laws are tested, where they're litigated, where they're pushed by civil society and NGO and, and media attorneys, we are making a lot of progress. Uh, we were just in, in India looking at some of the work that the journalists there have done with their right to information law. It's extraordinary. So things are changing. And, and uh, you know, we have so many problems in doing investigative reporting. We've never had enough uh, 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 resources. You know, one, one of my teachers used to say that the, there were never any good old days. We've always had to struggle. 
Uh, our, our bosses can be tough. Our editors don't want to give us the, the, the time. It's a burnout occupation. Um, uh, we have legal threats. We have physical threats. Journalists are being killed and assaulted at near, near record uh, rates. Um, despite all that, we're on the right side of history. Things are getting better, not worse. Uh, some of this violence is because we're pushing harder than ever before, because journalists are doing this in places where investigative reporting didn't exist even, even 15 years ago. Uh, and that's exciting. People are expecting documents and data and financial reports. Uh, some of this is because of globalization. The price for access to the global market is a certain degree of openness. If you want to be a player in the modern economy, you have to give up data. You have to talk to the World Bank and the IMF and the OECD and the UN and, and, and the USAID and the EU. You have to give up data about your education rates, about literacy, about infant mortality, about health care, about international trade, about what you're exporting and importing, about your balance of payments. You need to do that. It's good for your own country to figure out what the problems are. And, and you need uh, 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 an independent watchdog who's going to help analyze that. Um, this is interesting. This, this is a, a survey that Transparency International, the anti-corruption NGO, did last year. They asked business people in 30 countries, what's the single most effective tool to fight corruption? In 20 of those 30 countries, well, they, 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 they asked about national anti-bribery laws. They asked about uh, uh, due diligence by, by business. Uh, they asked about uh, international treaties. In 20 out of 30 countries, business people picked investigative journalism. Oops, sorry. Well, well, we can come back to that if you want. Keep going. Let's go. Okay. All right, good. Here's, here's a little more show and tell because I'm, how am I doing on time? Ian? We're okay? Five minutes? Okay, because we want to leave a lot of time for, for questions here. Here's that uh, South African death squad again. Um, this is the story by the, the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism in, uh, uh, this is either 2000 or 2001. Um, there had been, they had a very popular president, Joseph Strada, uh, who, uh, there were rumors and, and, and unconfirmed reports that uh, he had amassed huge amounts of wealth uh, and in many countries, like the Philippines, um, elected officials have to fill out an asset disclosure form. There are lots and lots of countries with these forms, and politicians routinely lie about what they put on there because they don't want people to know that they're, they're profiting off of their position. Uh, the PCIJ, the Philippine Center, thought uh, that their own president was involved in this. Um, they tried to pull the public records. Well, in, in Manila, if you go to the public records office, which has property holdings and, and incorporation papers, they will only give you three a day. Pretty hard to do an investigation with three documents a day. So they sent a uh, secretary every day for three months to this public records office till they had a stack like this. They entered it into a spreadsheet. They got a hold of all of his relatives and business pals, and they, they analyzed uh, how much how much assets uh, he really had. Well, he had millions and millions of dollars. He had three mistresses and mansions. He had luxury cars. And, and uh, after they published this series, uh, he, he resigned six months later. There were three articles of impeachment against him. One of them was for lying about his asset declaration. Uh, here's another look. Can Estrada explain his wealth? Um, this was done in the Philippines, which is a pretty rough place. And it was done with, with public record documents. And, and it, was, it was done uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, th this is spread like a good virus around the world. This is what the journalists in, in, in Ukraine are doing right now, piecing together the record of accountability. Um, this is by a, a, a Ghanaian journalist in, in West Africa. He's become famous for doing undercover work. And he, he went into uh, uh, Ghana's most notorious uh, uh, mental institution. This, this place has medieval conditions. 
Uh, he actually repeated what had been done 100 years earlier by a, uh, a reporter named Nellie Bly who worked for, for a New York newspaper. It was called 10 Days in a Madhouse. It's considered a classic of, of investigative uh, reporting literature. Uh, only now, Anas goes in with uh, you know, one of these button digital cameras and records everything that, that is taking place. And it's, it's horrifying, and he, he forced major reform. This, this, is, this is what's going on in West Africa. This is a piece from uh, one of our members uh, based in Amman, Jordan, Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, where they, they looked at, um, uh, amid all the, the turmoil in Egypt, they actually looked at uh, how there's an incubator shortage. You know, the, the, these are special units for, for preemies, for premature born kids, and how bureaucrats had so badly bungled the, the supply that 100,000 infants a year were needlessly dying. What, what a headline. I mean, this is, this is, it wasn't that this was such a strong investigative piece. You know, it's more like really good uh, consumer reporting. But, but again, this, this is the kind of journalism that is, is spreading around the world. Uh, here's a piece by our colleagues in, in Italy. Although they showed uh, uh, um, uh, uh, how products or food products are being routinely mislabeled. They went on to break the story about how the, the mafia has been adulterating olive oil, and that, that went worldwide. Um, uh, Pazza Publica is a, a, a nonprofit attached to a university in uh, uh, Guatemala, uh, another very rough place to do investigative journalism. This is a, a, a hard-hitting piece on the abuse of public subsidies. Um, all right, I'm going to run out of time here. Um, uh, Telia Sonora, Sweden's biggest telecommunications company, which Swedish Public TV did a piece uh, uh, last year on how they were paying, uh, let's see, where is this? Uh, in Uzbekistan, they were paying the family on the side to get contracts. The, the, the president of Telia Sonora had to resign be, because of this. Um, Channel 4 in, in Britain went uh, undercover on one of these cruise lines that goes around the world to show what the, that the, the, the crew was living in almost slave-like conditions in the, the, the bowels of the ship while everyone's partying upstairs. Uh, good story. Um, this, this piece by The Guardian, th this is one of the most notorious images out of the, the war in Syria where these bodies turned up in a, uh, in a reservoir. And um, the Guardian went back and traced the story behind this. And quite moving. They did a whole multimedia presentation, and it was based on interviews showing how, how investigative journalism is working uh, even amid uh, our, our worst conflicts. This is another kind of consumer piece. It comes out of uh, uh, an Indian weekly. Um, and, and again, it's not one of these, these huge exposés. Um, snake bites in India kill 50,000 people a year, mostly in rural areas, mostly poor people. Uh, and because they're poor, it doesn't get reported, there's not good data on it, and, 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 and nobody does anything about it. It was, it was just a, a great piece. And like, like the 100,000 kids dying of, of no incubators, you know, this, this just, uh, uh, the, the, it's an extraordinary headline. 50,000 people are needlessly dying from snake bites. Um, here's a piece Bloomberg did also in, in India. Uh, a Western and Indian reporter came together and traced what was, what was actually happening to the, the um, stipends for food aid that were going to the local level and, and how much were being pocketed by officials. Great follow the money story. Okay, uh, to, to Hong Kong and China. Uh, uh, there have been, as you know, lots of stories about uh, high officials in China profiting off of their position or their families doing it. Um, and uh, it's, it's gotten uh, quite a bit of controversy. There's, there's more to come. Uh, you probably saw uh, a couple months ago the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They've, been, they've had a huge leak of, of uh, 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 offshore holdings data from around the world. They finally got around to doing China uh, and Hong Kong. Here's, I just pulled this from their, their database, which is, is public. You can search by country now. And uh, this, this is a list from Hong Kong about who owns offshore holdings. Now, it's not, uh, these people aren't necessarily doing anything illegal. Um, but one of the biggest problems in following money around the world is, is that so much of it is hidden 
by our current financial system. And the, the, the uh, OECD and, and uh, 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 many other countries have been calling for much more transparency. So I, again, I think we're going to see more reporting like this. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's been a crackdown in China. It goes forward, it goes backward. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, Tsai Xin is certainly in the forefront. Uh, Southern Weekend is, is doing great stuff. And it's not, it's not just about corruption at high levels. It's about a culture of accountability. It's about creating a culture of investigative journalism, about natural disasters, uh, about earthquake damage, about, about uh, uh, whether people abuse their position at lower levels. Um, sorry? Wrap it up. Yes, I, I'm almost done. This is like one more slide. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I find that encouraging. You know, investigative journalism can be about bad doctors and, and lousy lawyers. It's about health care and women's issues. It's about kids dying because you don't have enough, enough incubators and, and snake bites. Um, you need people who are going to be watchdogs in your society. And we're finding, whether it's in China and companies defaulting and, and, and not knowing what was going on, or in the U.S. where you have someone like Bernie Madoff, who, who is, is stealing $15 billion from, from his clients. Um, okay, last uh, example. Uh, this one comes from California. California is uh, earthquake country. You don't have earthquakes in Hong Kong, do you? I don't think Hong Kong could exist if you had earthquakes here. Uh, I lived in California a long time. It's full of faults. We know the big one is coming. Everyone's worried. Uh, but no one had done a systematic investigation about whether the state's schools were prepared. So the Center for Investigative Reporting did it, and they, they did it in a clever way. They, they not only got the records of compliance for every school in the state, uh, but they created an app, my fault, and they distributed it publicly. So you could look up whether your school was, was protected. They did a kid's coloring book, uh, and, and it, was, it was such a, a popular series that uh, th this is the uh, Italian edition of Wired magazine, the high-tech magazine. They, they basically repeated the investigation, but they crowdsourced it. They got a hold of the, the records for the schools, and they said to everyone, all of the readers in Italy, go check your school and see if, if it's safe, uh, if, it's, if it's earthquake safe. And, and again, it was, it was a big hit. Uh, so uh, again, th this field is exploding. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be, be here. and. Uh, just share some of the news, and why don't I stop there and, and open it up for questions? Thank you, David. Sorry to cut you off, there, but just want to make sure there's enough time for Q&A. So if, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please raise your hand, wait for the, uh, the microphone, and please tell us, um, please tell us who you are. Um, gentlemen in the front, do you want to? No? <laughs> gentlemen over here, please. Hi, um, my name is Andrew Davis. I'm with Bloomberg. Um, you mentioned that everyone wants more investigative journalism. Yet, at this well, not everyone. Right. At the same time, you said it's not hard. Not Bloomberg, to for example. <laughs> we won't go there. Um, but you mentioned that uh, you're fighting for space in newspapers. You're fighting with editors, and I'm just wondering where where do you see the demand really coming from, and how can you come up with the funding to make sure it happens? Yeah, great question. Uh, uh, where does the demand come from, and, and where does the funding, uh, equally important, come from to, to fund this, this kind of work? Um, uh, we're big on new models. A lot of what we do is, is putting out how people are supporting and sustaining investigative journalism. Uh, the, the nonprofits are one solution. They're growing very quickly, but you need donors to support them. You know, Bloomberg's an interesting model. Bloomberg makes its money from terminals, and I think that's where the current uh, problem comes from. It's, it's a business for traders and investors, and, and the news business is kind of a, a value-added thing. Um, it was a pretty good model for quite a while, and they did some terrific investigative journalism. Sorry to see uh, the pullback. I worked for Bloomberg for a while in the 90s, uh, and, and it was an exciting time. Uh, and to have those kind of resources, to have such a cross-cultural, multinational staff that, that you can plug into, it's, it's great. Um, uh, in the West, we've been hit 
twice. We, we, we got the, the, the financial basis of our industry changed. We lost so much advertising revenue. And then we got hit with the recession. So it was really a double whammy. And, and we're still recovering. But, but hiring is, is back up. Um, data journalism, which came out of investigative reporting, is red hot around the world. And it's a great way to break news stories. I, I was just at the, the big data journalism conference in, in the US, uh, NICAR. Um, 300 people came to that conference five years ago. There were more than 1,000 this time. It's tripled in just five years. And, and you've got data journalists, hackers, journalists, code writers, professors, students, uh, this really great mix of people that are reinventing journalism. So that, that's exciting. That's going on. The nonprofits are going on. Schools are becoming, as I said, more like uh, teaching hospitals and, and becoming content creators. Uh, online startups like what Piero Midiar is, is funding now um, uh, are, uh, are another hopeful sign. Uh, the, the mainstream media ain't done yet. It's, uh, you know, in the States, they're, they're hiring again. Uh, and and um, uh, many publishers and broadcasters find that investigative reporting is profitable. Certainly, if you look at CBS's 60 Minutes, uh, which has made more than two billion dollars in profit since it was it was set up, uh, built their reputation. Their franchise is in part investigative reporting, and I think that's true of, of uh, you know great papers around the world, the the, the FT, New York Times. Uh, you know, South China Morning Post has done impressive stuff. Um, we'll always have limits. You know, again, there were never any good old days. I mean, I can remember having to fight all the time for time, for resources, for space. That ain't going to change. But we have new tools at our disposal. It's very exciting what's going on with journalists linking up internationally, and, and, and we can do so much more with so much less. And that's good, because it's just in time. Next question from me, please. Uh, hi, David. It's been a long time. Welcome to Asia. <laughs> Edith, <carry>. hi. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about your trip. Uh, can you give us some of the highlights in terms of uh, potential partners for what you're doing here and what uh, some of the challenges are that they face? So other organizations like the Center for Investigative Journalism in the Philippines, that's already a partner. Yeah, uh, PCGI, P PCIJ is one of our founding members, uh, and they're, they're still doing great work. Uh, I, I didn't go to the Philippines on, on this trip, but I've, I've been meeting with universities, with journalism associations. I was up in uh, uh, Kathmandu meeting with the Nepal Center for Investigative Journalism. They're doing terrific work, and you, you don't hear about uh, these, these stories because most of them, excuse me, most of them are local, uh, but they're having local impact. And the day we were there, they had broken a, a big story. It was on the front pages of the local newspapers on how police had covered up uh, a killing uh, because the, the, uh, the case was politically connected somehow. Um, every day we get stuff like this over, over email. And uh, uh, so basically, we're, we're trying to strengthen the, the networks here, help journalists work on, on uh, uh, training and and linking up with each other and uh, getting in touch with with their colleagues around the world and we're doing that you know through groups that already exist we're advising a few that want to start up and and we'll see how uh, how that goes but of, of those you know, we have 90 members I'd say half did not exist seven years ago uh, that's how quickly this is this is changing uh, another thing we work on a lot is sustainability and, and uh, you know, there's not enough donors out there. Uh, the reason the U.S. Has, has so many nonprofits isn't because Americans are so magically philanthropic. It's, it's because our tax law incentivizes them to give to nonprofits. Americans get a 100% tax deduction for giving to an educational or charitable organization. But anybody know what it is in Hong Kong? If we set up an NGO, do you get, do you get a tax break for giving money? It's small, yeah, yeah. But I guess the, the tax rate here is relatively slow, so the, the relative attractiveness of donating is, is lower than in the States. Yeah, economists like to talk in terms of uh, you know, incentives and, and, and how, how people respond to that, and it, it really has encouraged this huge nonprofit sector in, in, 
the states, and it's not just schools and, and, and religious institutions, you know, it's zoos and symphonies and, and, uh, and media organizations now. Ben, I think you have a question. Uh, thank you. Ben Richardson, formerly of Bloomberg News, um, until quite recently. So uh, I had the dubious honor of working on a couple of those Bloomberg stories, including the India one, um, and of course the 2012 Chinese uh, wealth stories. One of the things that I think depressed all of us who were involved in them was the lack of impact. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there a, you know, to what extent, I mean, how, how can you actually gauge the return on investment for big investigative pieces like that? Is that part of what holds back the um, ambition of news organizations and the, uh, and the, you know, the desire, desire to do more of these kind of stories? Uh, another good question. How, how do you gauge impact in, in doing investigative journalism? It, it, it would be nice if every story was like Watergate <laughs> and, and you see immediate uh, uh, impact. You know, try, try, try reporting on campaign finance and, and uh, abuses in the states. It's like, uh, you know, Firing a squirt gun at a brick wall. It, it has no impact whatsoever. One, well, one of our members joked that the way the U.S. dealt with corruption was by legalizing it. Um, but you do those stories anyway. It's, it's, it's almost like bearing witness and, you know, social, I studied sociology and, and as an undergrad and, and, you know, social change doesn't happen overnight. I mean, why, why did the, 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 the Arab Spring happen, you know, for better or worse? Uh, it, it, it wasn't a Twitter revolution. This thing was bubbling for years. Why did communism fall? One story does not make this happen. Um, you know, you, you, you do stories and sometimes you don't see the impact. Uh, for months or or even years, and and uh, it doesn't mean you don't do those stories. Now that that's over here. Uh, over here, you know, donors and, and I think others who invest in in investigative journalism do want to see impact. And we do have a lot of stories that well, most of those stories I showed you did have a lot of impact. That one on the South African police death squad, uh, there were more than a dozen people indicted because of that, and their trial is is ongoing. Uh, so you do see direct impact on a lot of these. There's been a whole school of uh, research that is, is uh, emerged on how to gauge impact from stories. And some of it's relatively straightforward. You know, how many people looked at it because of the internet, you can, uh, you can measure it uh, uh, pretty accurately now. Um, but where it translates into impact, uh, it's, it's trickier. And also, you know, we don't want to be activists, we want to be a, a, a you know, we're the diagnosticians and, and uh, we'll leave it to, to NGOs and, and civil society to, uh, uh, to push to the next step. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't want to monitor it and find out what happens. Okay, I'm not sure I answered it well, but we can pick it up later. Uh, how are we doing, Enid? Okay. Well, we've got a few more minutes left. Any more questions from the audience? Um, gentleman over there, please. Yeah, I'm To Han Shi from the South China Morning Post. I mean, supposing organizations like yours run, you know, exposés on corruption of the family wealth of powerful people and the leaders of countries like, say, North Korea or China or Singapore, and then the governments of these countries get really angry and defensive and accuse you of being a secret front for American intelligence services trying to undermine, do regime change, what would your answer be? <laughs> uh where to start. Uh, we don't run stories. Our members certainly do. We, we are not an editorial organization. We're a pres professional association. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, you know, 90 organizations that are doing so many different kinds of reporting. Um, you know, we want to enforce certain standards. We want to uh, make these as professional as possible. Uh, for us, transparency is as important for our members as, as it is for the people that they report on. Our donors are all on our website, um, uh, and, and we ask that all of our members do the same. Um, my board comes from 11 countries. Um, uh, our annual, our uh, biannual meetings are open. Our minutes are, are available. I'm, you know, I'm not sure what else to, uh, to
to say, I have a board composer of investigative journalists. That's not easy. <laughs> These are the toughest board members in the world. And they, they want to know where our money comes from. They want to know that it's well spent. They want to know if we have conflicts of interest. Uh, they demand disclosure. Uh, so you can imagine uh, uh, what our board meetings are like. Uh, actually, it's, it's a great board, and, and they're excited about how we're, uh, we're expanding. Um, uh, look, to a certain extent, we're, we're going to get criticized no matter what we do. Investigative reporting is controversial. I don't think the Post is, is immune from that kind of, of criticism either. It comes with the territory. Uh, I, I spent uh, 10 years in Washington. I was chief, uh, chief investigative correspondent for U.S. News and World Report. I reported on the CIA and FBI every week and had my share of crit sometimes that people thought I was I was too critical other times they thought I was I was uh, uh, too sympathetic I, I thought I was doing my job and it's the same thing we're doing now Francis RTH Hello this is Rick Hi. RTHK the government here is considering taking the current uh, code to access information and in some way altering it to make it a statutory code. So I have two questions. Uh, it will certainly include exemptions, areas where they will say, no, this information we, we won't give, whatever. So what are legitimate exemptions? The second question is, what's the case to make two bureaucrats why they should have an information act, because they can certainly see the benefits to them of not giving out information. But are there, in fact, benefits to uh, a government and administration to have access to information? Yeah. Um, let me take the second part first. Uh, um, what, what are the advantages of a Freedom of Information Act? Um, to the bureaucrats who have to fulfill it, not much. It adds to their workload. It's a burden. They really don't want to do it. And I don't know any country where, where, that's, uh, where, where that's different. I mean, starting in Sweden, which had the first Freedom of Information Act, I think, 300 years ago. They, they, they don't like it there either. Um, but society likes it. The public likes it. Uh, and, and, and I think public accountability demands, a healthy democracy demands that you have a, a, a statutory law that says you have a right to freedom of information. And FOIA is important because it, it turns on its head how societies have operated through history. Usually, citizens had to make the case about why information should be public. A freedom of information law typically says, no, 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 no. That citizens have a right to information on their societies. The daily doings of business, the budgets, the allocations of, of, of funds and people and resources, how schools are built, uh, um, uh, uh, transportation, communication, these are all matters for public discourse. And there's very few reasons why any of that should be private. Uh, exemptions, Francis, uh, you know, look, we, we don't want uh, spy satellite secrets, despite what, what Edward Snowden has. You know, nobody wants the keys to how these, these uh, um, uh, these technologies actually work. Um, I, I think we do want what's going on in our everyday lives, what our governments are doing with our tax money. Uh, and, and again, in a healthy democracy, there are very few reasons. 99% of the, the, the daily business of government should be public. And, and, it's, it's, uh, and there are a million stories that can show why that's important. You have to enforce accountability. You have to keep people healthy. You have to, to find out who's polluting your society and, 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 and if products that, are, that can hurt your children are, are on the market. There's no reason why that should be private. Great. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Um, we've got a little souvenir for you from the club. A souvenir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.